Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. Um, this is a, another Christmas podcast. <laughs> um, I was going to record it yesterday on Christmas, but I ended up waiting until today, the day after. Um, and I want to talk about divine providence um, in relation to Jesus's life and um, how he lived completely dependent on the Father and how the Father always provided for him. Um, and then also, you know, more than just the idea of divine providence being something physical, like, you know, I depend on God to provide food for me. The idea of um, all the different aspects of what happened to us in life being handed to us by divine providence, by a good father who loves us in heaven, right? And I'm going to draw very strongly from, um, from Father de Casaud, who I have a couple of his different books, um, Jean-Pierre de Casaud, uh, that I've just loved over the years. And then um, I've got his longest version, <laughs> I've got his middle version, and I've got his baby version that I was given um, when I was at Notre Dame in, I think, in 1997. Um, and then also um, a Father um, Claude de la Colombier, who was, I believe, the spiritual director of Margaret Mary Alacoque, but I know him kind of separately, and his his work on surrendering to divine providence. Um, but I wanted to do that here as we're meditating on, you know, baby Jesus in Bethlehem and how the Lord provided for him and the Holy Family and um, with the Magi coming and, you know, in the flight into Egypt um, and then applying that to our lives. So I already did a podcast on divine providence, but it's a second one. <laughs> It's kind of a different take on it. So I was unsure what song to do, and I was flipping through, and I found one that I wrote out when I was in Siberia. One of the priests had it in English, and he had it on a cassette tape, but I've never heard it in English. Um, so maybe praise and worship circles use it, maybe not, I don't know. But um, it's just about praising God, and as we um, turn to reflect on the gift of the Father providing for us, um, we want to always remember to have that spirit of thanksgiving and praise and worship of Him um, when we see Him provide and when we don't really understand what He's doing. Um, and it, you know, it talks about singing with the angels in heaven and um, and that's all a Christmas mystery too, right? Where the angels came down on the shepherd's field and sang Gloria, and they were the first witnesses of um, the Christ child. So let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit. All together, now in 
grace the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb Jesus holy Mary mother of God pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit amen I guess I should have practiced it a little more <laughs> my voice cracked I forget that I live alone and so I haven't spoken out loud to anyone since yesterday morning Christmas morning when I uh popped over quickly to see my parents um, but I was alone all day and all day today and so um, my voice is <laughs> cracking sometimes I go to talk and I realize all of the all of the um, thoughts I've had have been in my mind I haven't actually used my voice so thank you for your patience so we will talk about divine providence and once again we're going to keep baby Jesus right here with us and we think about this mystery of, um, of Bethlehem, of divine providence in the life of the Holy Family. And I hoped to have my icon of the Holy Family finished, but it's almost finished, but I thought I'm not going to pull it out. I will wait and use it for another one. We'll just look at baby Jesus here in the, um, in the manger, and I have my nativity here in St. Joseph with Jesus and Mary with Jesus. So that should be enough to kind of look at besides me, right? <laughs> um, but it's so beautiful to see that not only did Jesus give us that teaching, you know, from Matthew um, 5, 25, I believe, you know, do not worry about what you are to eat and what you are to drink and what you are to wear, um, you know, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And in the Luke version, I believe it's Luke 11. I should have looked that up. But um, where he says, do not worry any more little flock. He calls us his little sheep. You know, the Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Do not store up, you know, um, you know, bags that the moths will eat through right, with all of your earthly goods. But store up your treasures in heaven. 
And those are words and teachings that Jesus gave to us, um, not just by his mouth, not just by his brain coming up with them, right? But there's something that he lived profoundly with his whole life. And so we see how divine providence provided for him from the very beginning. We see in Bethlehem how he and um, where Joseph and Mary couldn't find a place for him to be born. And the father provided the cave. You know, and some people might complain and say, well, nice place you gave them. But how beautiful it is to see the glory of God, the majesty of God hidden in poverty. And, you know, what would be ordinary cobwebs probably shone like crystal, right? And what would be, you know, a smelly, you know, dirty in the way ox ended up being like a beautiful radiator that heated up the whole place, right? And, uh, you know, the, the silence of being away from the city allowed the voice of Our Lady to sing those first lullabies and to, you know, echo through the chambers of the the rock that they were within. So it's really beautiful to see how the Father provided for them and um, not only in giving them a cave, but then he sent angels to the shepherds nearby. One, he did not want his son to be without adorers, those first moments he was on earth. And he had the heart of his parents to adore him, but God wanted really to emphasize for the rest of eternity how he came for the poor. And so he sent those, you know, regal angels from heaven to the fields of shepherds and they announced his coming and they sent them. And I'm sure the shepherds brought warm, soft wool and, and um, you know, lamb's milk and all sorts of, you know, simple things that could help Joseph and Mary with baby Jesus. And as if that weren't great and beautiful enough, you know, months before he was born, the Lord allowed that Bethlehem star to shine in the sky. And he awakened in the hearts of three different, you know, astrologers or wise men from the East, a desire to follow that star. And they did, and they found the newborn king. And Providence allowed them to have a dream to tell them not to go back to Herod. And, and when they came, they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. Mary and Joseph had nothing, but the Lord knew that they would need something. And those gifts were symbolic. You know, the gold was for Jesus as the king. The frankincense was him as the priest. And the myrrh was he as the victim, right? He as um, the one that would be sacrificed for all of us on the cross, because that mystery of the crib must never be separated from the mystery of the cross. And then Joseph and Mary had something to help them when the angel came and told Joseph to flee, to not go home, to go into Egypt, to hide the Christ child so he wouldn't be killed. And they had nothing. And they could sell that gold, I'm sure, in order to find a little house somewhere, a place to settle. And you see how the father you know, provided for them. He provided Joseph with some kind of work, I imagine. He provided, they, they completely had to live dependent on the Father's goodness, and he did not disappoint them. And then he sent them back to Nazareth. And we see in Je Jesus's um, adult life as well, how he always lived dependent on the Father. You know, the first way and the most important way is not just like what the Father physically would give him, but it was being dependent upon the will of God to arrange life in such a way that it brought him great glory, right? And so we see the providence of God in asking Our Lady to be Jesus's mother and asking Joseph to be his father and providing a family for him providing protection for Our Lady through Joseph. We see the providence of God continued even when Joseph died and Mary was under the cross. God provided John through providence so that she wouldn't be alone. 
And, you know, in Jesus' life, he always said, I came to do the will of the one who sent me. If you read the Gospel of John, and it's all throughout especially, where he talks about doing the will of the one who sent him, right? And in Gethsemane, you know, Father, if you could let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but yours be done. You know, and when Peter wanted to fight the, so the soldiers that came at the beginning, he said, am I not to drink the cup that the Father gave me? Right? And when Jesus was um, at that well in Samaria with the Samarian woman, and his friends came back and they said, you know, here, take some food. And he said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. You know, sometimes God sent him food, right? When he was in the desert, the Lord provided for him. And, and it says that, you know, the angels ministered to him and, and took care of him in a kind of a spiritual way. But then there were times where, like, he was with the crowds and they were hungry and he multiplied bread for them. He probably had a bite of it, right? He had that within his power. He didn't use it for himself, but he was always provided for by God. When they were persecuting him and saying that he wasn't paying the temple tax, what did he say to Peter? Go to the water and grab a fish and open his mouth and there'll be a couple coins and you can pay my tax and yours, right? And it was, you know, he always said, you know, the foxes have dens and the birds have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And yet when you visit Jerusalem, you can find there the caves on that Mount of Olives where Jesus used to withdraw and spend the night. Often in scripture it said he went to the hills to pray all night, right? Or they would be out fishing and he would be on the shore praying that Jesus would spend the night alone in prayer. The Father provided him somewhere, right, with something. So you see that Jesus himself with his life lived that dependence on God. But it's easier, it's hard as it is to trust God when you really need something, right? When you've got that bill sitting on your kitchen cupboard and the money's not adding up, it's hard to trust God. But it's easier to trust him with something like that, paying the rent, than it is when, you know, your husband is dying of cancer or when your child is really sick. You know, or when, you know, your children abandon you and, and betray you. You know, when your siblings, you know, do something that's not very kind. It's harder to trust God in those kind of situations where it's not trusting him just in like physically feeding you or protecting you. But that there's some great good that can come from um, another kind of evil that happens to you. And that's where I think it was such a blessing that when I was at Notre Dame so many years ago, I was given this book first. Somebody bought a bunch of them and gave them out. Father de Cassad, Abandonment to Divine Providence, right? And I just have a few, I, I went through and I have a couple versions, but I thought I'm just going to share with you what I underlined in 1997 because it's still the parts that I think are best, right? And the one thing that he stresses is how um, the duties of the present moment are the shadows which veil the divine action. Where is God in my life? Sometimes it might be in something extraordinary, right? Like Jesus showing up and calming the storm or multiplying the fish. But sometimes it's just in the, your daily duty by you doing, you know, if you're a mom, by, you're not supposed to like, you know, go pray for three hours while your baby's crying in bed. It's changing those diapers. It's settling the arguments. It's doing the laundry. It's, it's your daily duty to your husband and children that God manifests his presence and his divine will for you, right? And that's, you know, where we see the hidden, he talks about the hidden springs of God's presence in Our Lady's life was that he came to her in her ordinary everyday life and asked her to be an ordinary mom of an extraordinary son. And she just said fiat to that. She said, God's will be done, right? 
And what did the angel say? The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the power of God Almighty was present in her normal everyday life. And that was God's will for her, to allow his magnificence to fill that which was most ordinary, right? God hides his power in the shadow of the ordinary. And so what, you have to look at your own life to see how that happens. You know, one of, the, um, one of the examples that he gives is, are you too sick to go to Mass? Well, it's no longer God's will that you go to Mass then, right? Like you don't have to worry. You have to just see God in the present, what he's allowing. Are you going you know, to Mass on Sunday and your car breaks and it won't start? Well, you know, it's no longer, it's not like you can't do God's will. It isn't God's will that you go because if it was, he would have made that car not break. God hides himself in the ordinary, right? Your life consists of unimportant actions, but God is content to use unimportant actions when we give them to him, right? Right? And that the perfection that he asks us to live is not just knowing his will, but fulfilling it always. Um, so when you have discerned that something is God's will, it's not just good enough to say, well, I want it. He wants you to fulfill it, right? He wants you to get off the sofa and to clean up after dinner, if that's his will for you right now. The mind is only useful enough in, um, in being an instrument of God's action when we use it. So you can come to know something's God's will, but unless you then fulfill it, then it's like you're a step behind, right? So when the soul longs for outward help, the divine action whispers to the heart that it alone suffices. You know, sometimes you really want to find um, an exterior guide to your life. You know, today I had a phone call from a friend who said, you know, if I could just talk to a priest that would tell me what to do. But she didn't have one and I did not have one I could recommend. And, um, my thought was, you know, kind of turned to this podcast that I wanted to do. Because when God deprives us of human help, right? When you don't have family around or friends or, you know, a spiritual um, support, then God himself wants to guide you. And that's something that um, St. Cloud de la Colombie speaks a lot about in here, and I'll read some excerpts about how the prophets of old were guided by the voice of God in their heart. And that when the earth is deprived of good guides, of people who really listen to God, are really not using human prudence, but divine, you know, that gift of the Holy Spirit of listening to what God wants and helping you to see where God is present in the midst of your life, right? When you're deprived of that, then God himself will be that light that guides your heart. John of the Cross does that, right? With no other light or guide except for you that shines in my heart, Lord. Under all circumstances, the soul should say continually with St. Paul, Lord, what do you want me to do? Whatever is your will. What is best for the soul is that what God wills for the present moment. And it can be mundane, right? Prayer, action, speaking, silence, vocal prayer, mental prayer, light, darkness. All of these are nothing because only your will has virtue in everything. Your will alone is the end of all my devotion. So, like I said, you could be a mom with a baby that has a dirty diaper and you're neglecting that baby so that you could pray. That's not pleasing to God. What's pleasing to God is that you always fulfill your daily duty, right? You could be a priest who has, you know, an extra penitent 
and you know you say well confessions ended and so we're not you know not gonna hear any more today well your daily duty is to hear that unless you have you know another urgent meeting or something you have mass that's starting or um, a meeting an appointment but if not you know say you're just hungry and you want to go eat lunch the daily your daily duty as a priest is to hear that extra confession right Fidelity to the duties of one state and submission to the dispositions of divine providence is the common lot of all the saints. What makes a saint a saint? It's living heroic virtue in ordinary everyday life, right? The saints live hidden in obscurity because the world is so evil they must avoid its dangers. But it is not on account of on this account that they are saints they are only saints on account of their submission to the will of god the more absolute their submission to god's will the greater becomes their sanctity right they find holiness in all things what consolation and courage they would gather from this thought that to acquire the friendship of God and all the glory of heaven, you have only to do what, they, you, what you are doing. You have only to suffer what you are suffering. And all which you count as nothing would suffice to enable you to arrive at eminent sanctity, right? Once you come to live in this habit of receiving and listening and discerning God's will and then responding to it, right? You start to allow him to live through you. And he writes, often you do not think, but he thinks for you. He only asks that you desire all that comes to you or may come to you by his divine order. He understands the disposition of your heart. So you pray, give me a pure heart, help me to know, love, and live your will. And then when you open yourself up to this, God begins to think through you. God begins to speak through you. God begins to love through you. God knows that you do not know what is best for you. So he makes it his business to give you what is most necessary. It matters little to him whether you're thwarted or not. You think you're going east and he makes you go west. You're going to strike against a rock. He turns the helm and brings you safely into port. Knowing neither map, nor route, nor winds, nor tides, nevertheless, all your journeys are happy ones. This is how you can come to holiness, is really to like allow yourself, imagine like when you're in a pool, when you're teaching a baby how to swim, right? You have to teach them how to float. That's the first thing. So the little girl that I nanny for, they have a pool. And so they had to give her swim, teach her how to survival swimming in case she ever fell in. And the first thing that this, this swim instructor did was to make sure that the, she would know how to turn on her back and how to float. Why? Because then she wouldn't drown. She wouldn't sink to the bottom. So her first instinct to teach her was to turn over on her back and to float. And then, you know, the water would keep her up. That's how it is with us in life. If we can learn to turn our face to heaven, keep our eyes on God, then no matter what comes, it can be like a river with racing water or it could be a pool where water's not moving, we'll float in the will of God, right? And then he'll carry us where we need to go. We just need to trust him. Love is the greatest um, source of of holiness is when we love God with everything we desire his will and then that opens our hearts so that we follow it when he reveals it even in the ordinary love produces holiness with all that accompanies it so no matter what happens in your daily life just imbue it with love fill it with love right make that cup of coffee with love clean that floor with love do your paperwork with love Love flows on every side, on the right hand and the left, into those hearts open to receive 
this divine outpouring. It's not only important to love, but to have faith. To have faith when things are difficult, that God is still with you, right? He writes, the one who walks by faith seeks only God and the things of God. He lives for God alone, forsaking and going beyond the appearance of things, right? And the divine action is more visible to the eyes of faith when it's hidden under repulsive appearances. How is that? In the same way, the soul that recognizes the will of God in small things, in the most desolate and deadly events, receives all with equal joy, pleasure, and respect. So if you can see like a great pandemic with all these people dying, but you see God's will in it, you don't know how, you don't know why, you don't know, you know, you might not understand, but you say, I really believe God has a will in this. Then you have joy no matter what happens around you, right? Ask Mary and Joseph and the Magi, the shepherds. They will tell you that they find in this extreme poverty that they encountered that Jesus was living something incredible, which increases the glory of God and his attractiveness. Faith is strengthened, increased, and enriched by those things that escape the senses. The less there is to human eyes, the more there is to the soul, right? To adore Jesus on Mount Tabor during the Transfiguration, to love the will of God in extraordinary circumstances, does not indicate a life animated by such great faith as to love the will of God in ordinary things, to adore Jesus on the cross. Faith cannot be said to be real, living faith until it's tried and triumphed over every effort for its destruction. Through this war of the senses, faith comes out glorious in the end. And you can see how beautiful that is in Our Lady at the foot of the cross. When the apostles fled, Mary, who was full of faith, remained steadfast at the foot of the cross. She recognized her son in that face spat upon and bruised. The wounds that disfigured him only made him more lovable and adorable in the eyes of his tender mother. The blasphemies poured forth against him only served to increase her profound veneration. Mary, who from the stable to Calvary remain, remained unalterably united to a God whom all the world misunderstood, persecuted, and abandoned. When the senses are a frightened, famished, destroyed, or crushed, when we don't see God in a situation, right? When Joseph was like, why is, you know, we don't have a place to put, give birth to baby Jesus. When we don't see God in a situation, then it is that the will of God nourishes, enriches, and strengthens the faith of our hearts, which smiles at these apparent losses just as a commander of an impregnable fortress smiles at the futile attacks of an enemy, right? You can read God's word from moment to moment. It's not written with ink on paper. You're not going to receive from God like a book that says, you know, you know, December 26, 2020, this is what I want you to do. God doesn't work like that. You receive God's word and his will written on your soul with suffering and daily actions that you have to perform. It's in the mundane, right? God writes his will just through whatever happens the souls of the saints are the paper, and the suffering and the actions are the ink. The Holy Spirit, with the pen of his action, writes a living gospel on the human heart. We can only read it on the last day when it will be drawn on 
from this press of the life and published, right? Oh, the glorious history, the beautiful book which the Holy Spirit is now writing. It still is still in the printing press, holy souls. There is never a day when the type is not arranged, ink applied, pages printed. We are still in the dark night of faith. The paper is blacker than the ink, and there is great confusion in the type. It is written in the language of another world, and we understand nothing. But we will be able to read it only in heaven. Divine love is communicated to us in a veiled way through other people, through other creatures, the same way that Jesus communicates himself to us in a veiled way through the Eucharist. He writes, Do we not know that divine love seeks to communicate itself to us through all creatures and all events? It has produced, ordained, or permitted everything about us, all that happens to us in view of this union, which is the sole end of all God's designs. To attain this end, he makes use of the worst as well as the best creatures, of the most distressing events as well as those which are pleasant and agreeable. Our union with him is even more meritorious when the means that serve to make it are of a nature repugnant to us. So you might look at somebody else's life and say, you know, you know, like he said, there are good creatures and bad creatures. Why is my life full of all the bad people being mean and their life is full of all those who love them, right? But what Father de Cassad says here is that your union with Jesus is more meritorious when what happens to you is repugnant. So you can really glorify God with this loving family and like joy and forgiveness and like all of that, right? But when something bad happens and your family turns against you or you feel alone or you feel sad, then that actually accepting that from the hand of God and offering it up, not understanding it, means more to him, unites you more to him than if you had the other, right? If you could understand this, if you could see it with the eyes of God, you would never criticize what he chooses to do in your life. And everything that happens to each one of us is to make us as holy as we can possibly be. So maybe, you know, this person you see over here that has, you know, a few more blessings than you might not have in your life, if they were given your crosses, wouldn't grow in holiness. They'd just be bitter. They'd despair. They, didn't, they don't have that strength of soul to bear it, right? So God gives them an easier lot. But for you, what does Therese of Lisieux, what do the greatest saints say? To the degree that you love God and are called to holiness is the degree of suffering you will be called to endure. So God knows how much, you know, holiness he wants to give you. And to that degree, he asks you to drink his cup with him, right? The cup of the crib, the cup of, cup of the cross, the cup of the, you know, the chalice, the, the cup of um, the altar. Jesus speaks to all hearts and to each one he utters a word of life. So one, the one word is applicable to us. Each person has one word that God is trying to speak to them. But so many times people do not hear it. People want to know what God has said to other people, but they don't listen to what God is speaking in their own lives. One has to open their heart to the divine action. And it will end, and that's all you have to do, and the divine action will enter into your heart, right? All you have to do is say fiat like Our Lady. All you have to do is surrender, right? Look at baby Jesus' little hands raised. 
If all souls were faithful copies of Jesus' divine example, then they would speak, act, and live divinely. That's what we're called to do by just accepting what God gives us in the present moment. They wouldn't need to copy each other, but they would be singled out and rendered unique by divine action acting through the most ordinary things. Who God wants Mary Klaska to be is going to be very different than who he wants, you know, my sister to be or my friend to be. By what means, oh my God, writes Father Kassad, can I make your creatures appreciate what God is offering to them? How often do we bemoan our own lives and just not appreciate that God is present with us? Must I, who possess such a great treasure with which I could enrich the whole world, see souls perish in poverty because they're not accepting it? Right? You're not accepting the will of God. Well, what is God's will? Whatever is happening to you. God is so big. He's so great. He's present in everything. Right? Must I see them withering like plants in a desert when I show them the source of living water? You know what? You call your mom and she hangs up on you and yells at you. Praise God. He allowed it for your good, for something. So instead of getting upset about it, praise him, right? Praise him, praise him. No matter what happens, praise him. Come, simple souls, you who have not the least trace of devotion, you who have no talent, nor even the rudiments of education, you who cannot understand a single spiritual term, who stand astonished at the eloquence of the learned whom you admire, come and I will teach you a secret that will place you far beyond these brilliant intellects. To be holy does not mean to understand these great theological teachings, right? He says, I will make perfection so attainable that you will find it always within you, always around you, at every step. I will unite you to God and he will hold you by the hand from the moment that you begin practicing what I tell you. God alone can make known to each soul the purpose he is destined to realize. So what is this great way to become holy that doesn't need theological, like intellectual things? Accepting the will of God. It's my fiat. It's Our Lady's fiat. It's Joseph's fiat. It's Jesus's fiat, right? Anybody who knows me, you know, my nieces and nephews always called me Auntie Mary fiat. Fiat is my, my motto. Why? Because let it be done. Let God's will be done, not mine. And if you can say fiat in a rice field in China, or you can say fiat in the you know, inner city of Monterrey, Mexico, and you know, if you can, it doesn't matter where or what, if you can really surrender to the will of God on Wall Street, then you can become a saint. God is a different form of sanctity for each one of us. And God himself guides the souls who abandon themselves to him. God himself will guide you. God is leading you. And when you accept that, the soul has so much grace from accepting it that they live in forgetfulness of the instrument on which God works and thinks. And instead, he only thinks about God. So if you can just accept that, that idea. You'll stop even thinking about yourself. You'll just think about God in everything, everywhere, right? And you could say, well, what about when everything's dark and I don't know what God wants and it feels like God has abandoned me? All the more, his action is in the present moment, right? The more God seems to withdraw his light, if you are abandoned to him, then the more safely he guides you. To know what God is asking of you, you only need to probe your own heart and listen to the inspiration of his anointing, which will interpret the will of God according to the circumstances. Doing this shows such a soul, either by necessity, by allowing it only one course to choose at that time, or by a first impulse of a supernatural feeling. 
So for example, if you don't know what to do in a situation, but there's only one thing you can do, like, you know, you make phone calls and nobody answers except one place. Well, then that's probably God's will, right? So if God closes all doors except for one, then you can be pretty sure that's his will. Or say something is presented to you with some options and one of them, oh, lights your heart on fire with those gifts of the Holy Spirit, with joy and peace and excitement, right? Then that's probably God's will, right? A first impulse. And then sometimes a kind of inclination or an aversion through the Holy Spirit. So like you can see two things, but your soul, not necessarily like your feelings or your mind, but your soul is like, has a feels a pull in one direction or not against something else you're like eh, i just am not comfortable with that then it's probably not god's will so there's different ways that god can guide you if you were to judge things by appearances exteriorly it would seem to be a great want of virtue to pursue an uncertain course if one were to judge by ordinary rules there appears to be a want of regulation or stability in such conduct. But in reality, it is the highest degree of virtue. And only after practicing it for a long time does one succeed, right? So some people might say, well, that doesn't make sense. She did this in this situation and this in this situation. But if you're following, if you've surrendered yourself to God and you're following that divine impulse, right? And those fruits of the Holy Spirit or, or repugnant, you know, something that tells you this is not from God, then you're following a perfect path, even if you are, you know, mentally in a darkness. The virtue in this state of following God's presence in the present moment is pure virtue. It's the virtue of perfection. If you live like this, the simplest sermons, the most ordinary conversations, the least elevating books become to such souls by virtue of the will of God, sources of knowledge and wisdom. Have you ever met someone who can really pull out a divine lesson from God from the most ordinary things? It's somebody who's really united to him, right? God can use anything to speak to them. The less capable you feel um, of defending yourself in a difficult situation, the more powerfully God will defend you if you surrender to the difficult situation, right? God loves to defend his own people. You must keep your eyes on always being surrendered to God's will, and God will justify you. God will defend you, right? And he goes on and on and on about that. So that's Father Jean Pierre de Cassaud, right? And um, then we have Saint Claude de la Colombière. And I have all sorts of things, you know, underlined here to read about, you know, abandoning to divine providence in your daily life and allowing God to provide for you the same way he did in Bethlehem, right? The same way he did all throughout Jesus' life. He says that it's the only um, way, by surrendering to God's will, by praying that fiat, right? Thy will be done. It's the only way to find peace on earth, even in the midst of war, even in the midst of difficult situations. God reveals his will to us in all sorts of ordinary things. So he goes through a list, and I'm just going to kind of mention them here. One, in the natural incidents of our daily lives, right? So we just surrender to God's will in the midst of heat and cold, storm and calm, in everything that happens in the weather, right? Everything that happens around us. We bless and praise the Lord. 
just like they did in the fiery furnace, right? You know, that canticle Daniel saying, bless the Lord, all the works of the Lord, praise and exalt him above all forever. You know, angels of the Lord, you know, snow and, and ice, bless the Lord, fire and heat, bless the Lord. You know, no matter what happens in your life, praise and adore the Father, right? You know, here you've got this dire poverty in Bethlehem where Jesus is turned away from all the inns. And what is the angels? Are the angels out bashing the innkeepers? No. They're singing glory to God in the highest. And they're providing through the ordinary little shepherds, right? So God can be found in what naturally happens around us. God can be found in public calam um, calamities, right? Some, like it, that would be plagues, the coronavirus, right? But we have to remember that the very hairs of our head are numbered, Jesus says. God knows everything. And if he allows public calamities to happen, earthquakes and plagues and things like that, then he's somehow present in that, right? And we just have to surrender to him in that. In the cares and the difficulties of family life, God is present, right? In the reverses of fortune, when you have, say you made a million dollars and then you lost it in the stock market, the Lord is given and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? You know, you could have become a, a, a famous um, musician and then somebody calumniated you and all your music got stolen. Well, the Lord gave and he took away, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. In poverty and hardship, we're called to always accept the will of God, no matter what happens. In adversity and disgrace. So even when people calumniate you, even if, um, you know, you're publicly humiliated, you must realize that if you surrender that to God, who allowed that to happen to his son, who was the son of God, they lied about him. They humiliated him. They mocked him. They rejected him. And he brought the salvation of the whole world from it. So if that happens to you, surrender to God's will. Ask him to do something beautiful. Try to ignite that faith in your heart that he is doing something beautiful. And I'm just listing these. But, you know, you can get um, Claude de la Colombier's book in the big version, the middle version, or even this little one. But I really recommend that you get it and that you read his explanation of each one of these because he, of course, can more eloquently explain it. This one is the trustful surrender to divine providence and it's very short, okay? It's interesting, you know, when bad things happen to you, here's an example that he used. He told about an old man who was attacked by a mob of pagans in Alexandria. He remained calm and unruffled in sp spite of the insults and blows. Someone asked him mockingly, what miracle has Christ ever worked for you? You know, you were just beaten to a pulp. And he said, he has just worked one. For in spite of all the evil you've done to me, I haven't been angry with you or upset in the least, right? So God isn't always going to um, keep bad things from happening to us, but he will give us virtue within it, right? In defects of nature, God's will is there, right? Um, so say we're not as talented as someone else. That's God's will in sickness and infirmity, right? St. Bonaventure relates that St. Francis of Assisi was afflicted by an illness which caused him great pain. One of St. Francis's followers said, Ask our Lord to treat you a little more gently, for it seems to me he lays his hand way too heavily upon you. Hearing this, the saint gave a cry and addressed the man with these words. If I did not think that what you have just said comes from the simplicity of your heart without any evil intention. I would have no more to do with you because you have been so rash as to find fault with what God does to me. Then, though he was very weak from the length and the violence of his illness, he threw himself down from the rough bed he was lying upon 
at the risk of breaking his bones and kissing the floor of his cell, he said, I thank you, O Lord, for all the sufferings you send me. I beg you to send me a hundred times more if you think it right. I shall rejoice if it pleases you to afflict me without sparing me in any way for the accomplishment of your holy will is my greatest consolation, right? So no matter what happens, we have to praise him. You know, another way we see God's will is in the death, in our death and the manner in which we die. We know that just as we did not create ourselves, God designed our birth, our conception, our birth, our family, our situation, our country, our culture, our race. God also has already prepared our death for us. And we have to surrender to whatever it is. In the loss of spiritual consolation, right? We have to trust that if everything seems dark and despairing, God has a reason for removing that consolation from our hearts to make us holier than we would have been, right? There's many examples of that. And the consequences of our sins. You know, sometimes we do something wrong and we apologize for it and God forgives us, but he allows us to still suffer the consequence. Why? It's, it's a mystery to perfect us, to allow us in justice, to make up for it in, in union with Jesus so he doesn't have to suffer that alone, right? In interior trials, we must always surrender to God's will. There's examples of St. Teresa and St. Francis. In spiritual favors, if God gives us favors, we surrender and we accept them. You know, you might not always understand why he gives them. You know, sometimes people are like, oh, you know, did you see the light coming from such and such? You know, what does it mean? To me, I always say, oh, praise God. You know, that's really beautiful. I do see the light. You know, obviously God's trying to highlight something, but you don't want to like make up, fabricate some meaning because like you don't always know it. Now, if you were praying, Lord, give, you know, shed light on this issue and show me is this, you know, something from you or not, and you see a light, then it might, you know, guide your heart in that direction. Like, wow, God is present there, right? But you don't want to um, put a false meaning on it, right? So, for example, um, you know, that's in one of the graces that God gives you. So, one of my holy cards of St. Therese of Lisieux started oiling. And everybody asked, you know, I showed my dad and he told some people, and everybody asked, well, what does it mean? What does it mean? Maybe it means something for me. I would not be so audacious as to put a meaning on it. I think it meant that Therese felt bad for me and wanted me to know that she was with me. She was taking care of a situation. She was interceding for me. But to say it means that so-and-so or such-and-such is going to happen, right? I can't say that, you know. All I know is that the holy card had something. So when God gives a favor, you want to surrender to his wisdom and his presence within it. But you can't put a human meaning on it because we don't know the mind of God, right? We don't know the mind of God. And he said, you know, sometimes people question this way of living. Should we attribute attribute to God when we're unjustly persecuted, right? When people, you know, do terrible things to us? Yes. He is the only person you can charge with the wrong that you suffer. He is not the cause of the sin of the people who persecute you. But he is the cause of the suffering that person inflicts on you while sitting. Because if God wanted, he could... Have you ever had somebody do something terrible to you and you really didn't care? That was God preventing them from being able to hurt you, right? You know, sometimes people say, you know, well, it doesn't bother me when so-and-so does this. Well, then that means that God is protecting you from the consequence of that person's sin, right? Against you. But... Other people might not have that grace. And when people hurt them, they actually really feel it because God wants their hearts to suffer the way his heart suffers over that sin, right? It's, it's, a, it's a gift of being able to offer up that pain. So whether you feel that suffering or not, it's dependent on God. 
If all the living creatures were to league themselves against you, unless the Creator wished it and joined with them and gave them the strength and the means to carry out their purpose, they'd never succeed. You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above, the Savior of the world said to Pilate. So if people do terrible things to you, you have to believe that God is allowing it for a greater good, not because he doesn't like you. You know, so-and-so can do something to you with bitterness and evil intention in their heart. God allows it with love in his heart in order to bring a greater good out of it, right? We have to trust God's wisdom in what he allows to happen to us and what he doesn't allow, right? So those are the main points of um, Father Jean-Pierre de Cassaud. But I have a couple other little things here that I outline. This whole book is underlined. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because, like I wrote here, my theology of fiat. It's basically living fiat. No matter what happens to you, fiat, Lord, whatever your will were, is, right? And it's funny that reading these books separately, I found that I underlined the same sentences in each one, which means that's really what the Lord was highlighting. Um, but the first has to do with Our Lady and her fiat and how you see divine providence working in that, right? But then the second part here that I just want to kind of um, touch on here before we end is speaking to the soul who's looking for... Um, guidance or help in the world and the lord has deprived you of creatures he's deprived you from you know maybe believing family or loving family that's willing to listen to your problems and help you along or and has deprived you of spiritual friends who are willing to help you when you need it the most and may even deprive you of spiritual help in the church you know, there are many places where it's where you can't find a priest who's willing to listen and to help and to love and to guide and to be faithful in a friendship. And what Jean-Pierre de Cassaud says is that, is there any creature whose action can equal that of God? No. You know, even the most loving, compassionate friend or, you know, you think about people who are like, oh, my mother would do anything for me. That's nothing compared to the presence of God, right? And what God in his omnipotence and his compassion, look on the cross, can do for you. Why then should I go to creatures for help, since all that happens to me is the work of God's uncreated hand? Creatures are powerless, ignorant, and without affection. And I should die of thirst, rushing like this from one fountain to another, from one stream to another, when there is a sea at hand, the waters of which encompass me on every side. All that happens to me, therefore, will be food for my nourishment, water for my cleansing, fire for my purification, and a channel of grace for all my needs. Why would I look for consolation and comfort from people when you know, in a situation when God is everywhere and he's allowing it and he actually can do something about it. Instead, recognizing his presence with me and surrendering to it is what's going to give my thirsty heart drink, right? And Jesus and Mary are the example he gives in this. The hearts of Jesus and Mary bearing the fury of the darkest of nights on Calvary, right? Let the clouds gather and the storm rage. A multitude of things in appearance most oppressed to the designs of God and of his order overwhelmed their faculties. But though deprived of all sensible support, they walked without faltering on the path of love and obedience. Their eyes were fixed only on what they had to do. Surrendering to the cross, right? And leaving God to act as he pleased with all that concerned them, they endured the whole weight of the divine action of Calvary. They groaned under the burden, but not for a single instant did they waver or pause. So they may have cried. Tears may have come from their eyes. 
but they did not say no. They believed that all would be well, provided that they kept on their way and let God act. Why? Because Romans 8.28 says, all things work for the good of those who love God, right? All things. And he's talking about us um, imitating them in that. How we are called to become all to all, but to remain ourselves abandoned and indifferent. Remain in the dark and narrow prison of your miserable cocoon, little worm, he writes until the warmth of grace forms you and sets you free. So all the evil that can happen to you is like God forming you into this great saint. So he says, just endure it until God comes and frees you. Then feed upon whatever leaves God offers to you and do not regret in the activity of abandonment the peace you have lost. Stop directly what the divine action tells you to stop doing. Be content to lose all the things that God asks you to lose, all your old formulas, methods, and ways, and take upon yourself what the divine action and God's divine presence is asking of you in this moment. Thus you will spin your silk in secret, doing what you can neither see nor feel, you will condemn in yourself a secret envy of your companions who are apparently dead and motionless because they have not yet arrived at the point that you have attained. You continue to admire them, although you have surpassed them. May your affliction and your abandonment continue while you spin a silk in which the princes of the church and of the world and all sorts of souls will glory to be attired. You know, instead, so often, you know, it's easy to look at other people and compare and wish that you could be like them. But sometimes if you just accept what God's doing with you, you're surpassing them. Are you as famous as them? Probably not, right? Very few famous people actually reach sanctity, right? It's the despise that reach it very quickly. And it's hard when God seems absent because then it's like you're doing this on your own. The bride recognizes the bridegroom unconsciously, but when she stretches out her hand to him, he disappears. She understands that the spouse to whom she belongs has rights over her. She prefers to wander without order or method in abandoning herself to his guidance rather than to endeavor to gain confidence by following the beaten tracks of virtue. You know, sometimes you're like, I don't even know what to do, right? Surrender to God that you're lost in that darkness. And that's more pleasing than if you had that confidence of, oh, I will be patient, right? And like you follow the set regimen, you know, just being, you know, floating right in that divine will carries you more quickly. Let us go to God then, my soul, in abandonment. Let us acknowledge that we are incapable of acquiring virtue by our own industry or effort. But let us not allow the absence of particular virtues to diminish our confidence. Our divine guide will not have reduced us to the necessity of walking if he did not intend to carry us in his arms. What need have we of lights and certainties, ideas and reflections? Of what use would it be to see, to know, to feel when we are no longer walking, but being carried in the arms of divine providence? The more we have to suffer from darkness and the more rocks, precipices and deserts there are in our way, the more we have to endure from fears, dryness, weariness of mind, anguish of soul, and even despair, and the sight of purgatory and hell, the greater must be our confidence and our faith. 
one glance at him who carries us is sufficient to restore our courage in the greatest peril. We will forget the paths and what they are like. We will forget ourselves and abandoning ourselves entirely to the wisdom, goodness, and power of our guide. We will think only of loving him and avoiding all sin. Not only that which is evident, however venial it may be, but even the appearance of evil and of fulfilling all the duties and obligations of our state of life. This is the only charge you lay upon your children, O divine love, just to surrender to your will. All the rest you take upon yourself. The more terrible this may be, the more surely can your presence be felt and recognized. Your children have only to love you without ceasing to fulfill their small duties like children. A child on its mother's lap is occupied only with its games, as if it had nothing else to do but play with its mother. The soul should soar above the clouds, and as no one can work during the darkness of the night, it is the time for repose. The light of reason can do nothing but deepen the darkness of faith. The radiance necessary to disperse it must proceed from the same source as itself. God communicates himself to the soul as its life, but he is no longer visible. The bride seeks the bridegroom during this night. She seeks him before her and hurries forward, but he is behind her, holding her with his hands. He is no longer object or idea, but the principle and source of everything. For all the needs, difficulties, troubles, falls, overthrows, persecutions, and uncertainties of souls that have lost all confidence in themselves and their own action, they are secret and inspired resources in the divine action, marvelous and all unknown. The more perplexing the circumstances that you find yourself in, the keener is the expectation of a satisfactory solution. The heart says all goes well. It is God who carries on the work. There is nothing to fear. Now oh, there's so much more I could share. But right here at the very end from this bigger book, When the soul is moved by divine influence, it forsakes all works, practices, methods, means, books, ideas, and spiritual persons in order to be guided by God alone, by abandoning itself to that moving power which becomes the sole source of its perfection. It remains in his hands like all the saints, understanding that the divine action alone can guide it in the right path. The action of God guides and conducts souls by ways which it alone understands. It is with these souls like the changes of the wind. The direction is only known at the present moment and the effects follow their causes by the will of God. This is so salutary for you to read the whole thing, right? As I'm talking about not needing to read anything, but if it can help you to live it, it's so powerful. One must restrict oneself to the present duty without thinking of the preceding one or the one that is to follow. I imagine the law of God to be always before you and that the practice of abandonment has rendered your soul docile to the divine action. You feel some impulse that makes you say, I have a drawing towards this person, or I have an inclination to read a certain book, to receive or to give certain advice, 
to complain of certain things, to open my mind to another, to receive confidence. Well, obey this impulse according to the inspiration of grace without stopping to reflect, to reason, or make efforts. Give yourself up to these things for as long as God wishes because God wants to show you that he dwells within you. Worldly wisdom cannot understand the perpetual wanderings, the lack of order of the apostles who didn't settle anywhere. Ordinary spirituality can also cannot endure that souls should depend for their action completely on divine providence. And sometimes God leaves you completely alone. That's not bad, right? You have to have confidence in God. You might say to him, but it is so dark, I can't tell what way to go, Lord, right? Go wherever you please. You cannot lose the way where there is no path. Isn't that beautiful? Every way looks the same in the dark. You can't see the end because nothing is visible. But I am afraid of everything you say. I feel as if at every moment I might fall into a precipice. Everything is an affliction to me. I well know that I'm acting according to abandonment, but it seems to me that there are things I cannot do without acting contrary to virtue. I seem to be so far from the virtues. The more I wish to practice them, the more remote they seem to me. I love virtue, but the obscure impressions by which I'm attracted seem to keep virtue far from me. I give in to this attraction, although I cannot perceive that it guides me well. I perceive nothing, right? This is because it's impossible for God to lead a soul without persuading it that the path is a right one. And this with a certainty that all other paths are not as good as this one, right? And so she's depending on her own confidence, like I know my path, right? God doesn't want you. He wants you to depend on him. He wants you to understand that the spouse to whom you belong has rights over you. And you must prefer to wander without order or method in abandoning yourself to his guidance rather than to endeavor to gain confidence by following the beaten track of virtue. So he allows you to feel like that. And you just have to remember, you can't be lost when you're in the arms of love. So surrender yourself to love, right? Surrender yourself to what God is doing in the present moment. He says to a sister, who is complaining that she has no human help. Raise your heart to God and he will not refuse to guide you when all other guidance is taken from you. Choose unhesitatingly what you believe in good faith to be the most suitable and most useful to souls and the most in conformity with the will of God. Whatever may be the result, you must believe that you have acted rightly because under the circumstances, you could not have done better if you have no guide. Do you really think that God demands impossibilities? No. The same thing as she's complaining about the absence of a spiritual director, right? And she's, he's, he writes to her about it. If you could just accept the at departure of your director, it would be the occasion of the most meritorious act of abandonment to God. Thus, you would gradually become detached from creatures and unite yourself to him, who alone is your sovereign good. What safety as to the future life and unchangeable peace for the present to be in God alone, to have no other treasure, no other support, no other help or hope but God alone. There was a beautiful sister that wrote to me on the subject and said, God alone, I have only God. 
And these words gave her so much consolation and support that instead of regret, she felt full of peace and inexplicable joy that her director was gone. It seemed to her that God took the place of the director and that in the future, he would correct and instruct her himself. I have this whole book underlined, but the last one here has to do with an interior martyrdom, a death of self-love, right? He writes, it is a holocaust in which it is completely consumed by the fire of divine love. When you surrender your nothingness and your failures to him, right? It's a holocaust of being consumed by divine love. You must not be surprised at the violent resistance that your soul offers, especially when the soul experiences mortal anguish in receiving a death blow to their self-love. The suffering one feels then is like that of a person in agony. It is only through the painful agony and by the spiritual death which follows that one can arrive at the fullness of divine life and an intimate union with God. What else can be done when the painful but blessed hour arrives except to imitate Jesus Christ on the cross? Commend one's soul to God. Abandon yourself more and more utterly to all that the sovereign master pleases to do to his poor creature, to endure the agony for as long as he pleases. It's just always surrendering to him and the mystical death. It's just really beautiful, right? Have patience. The fearful darkness you are in will be succeeded by a clear light, a brilliance of which will delight you. The bitterness part of your trials, those ideas of being separated from God, which plunges you into a kind of hell, is the most divine of all the operations of divine love in you. But the operation is completely hidden beneath altogether contrary appearances. It is the fire which seems to destroy the soul while purifying it of all self-love as gold is refined in the crucible. Remain as a block of wood and you will see later the marvels that God will have worked during the silent night of inaction. Self-love, however, cannot endure to be held itself, to behold itself completely despoiled, reduced to nothing. But if you are nothing, this will be a great treasure. You know, and as I'm speaking, I'm getting like more and more intense spiritually, right? Like, you know, this, you know, first I'm talking about surrendering to God and changing a dirty diaper. Then here I end up talking about the crucible of agony, of darkness and all of that. But it's all tied together in the same thing. There's one thread that goes through all of this. It's the thread that we see from Bethlehem that continues to Calvary onto the altar at every mass and up into heaven glorified. It's the thread of God's love and omnipotence and his holy will that surrounds us in everything. So go back to the beginning where I listed the different ways that God can manifest his will to you when it's beautiful and when it's difficult and just accept it, right? You don't have to like it. You don't have to understand it, but that's where real trust comes in. That with like baby Jesus, with his little arms outstretched, that we can pray, Jesus, Father, I trust in you. Father, I trust in you, right? And we know like he sent the Magi with the gold, he'll provide what we need in our lives physically but also with the dream to guide St. Joseph to flee into Egypt, he'll protect us. And then all the way down to Lazarus, where when he was, when he was told that Lazarus was going to die, what, he stayed for three days. He knew it was the Father's will that Lazarus die so that he could be raised. God is every moment of our life, every relationship, every persecution, every suffering 
planned out to make us into the saints that he created us to be. So we want to praise him for that, right? We praise and glorify him and adore him for that. We thank him for that. We ask for the grace to surrender with a deeper and fuller fiat every day. And that we can trust that when he brings people to us, that that's what he wants. When he takes them away, that's what he wants. That the different circumstances that follow our lives, our vocations, our ministries, our work, may all be in the hands of the Father. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Jesus, we trust in you. Jesus, we trust in you. Jesus, King of our hearts, we trust in you. St. Jean-Pierre de Cassaud, pray for us. And I don't know, I don't think um, he's... Uh, or St. Claude de la Colombie, pray for us. I was going to say, I don't think Father Jean-Pierre de Casaud is canonized, but he's kind of a saint. <laughs> okay, God be with you. I will see you next week.